Welcome to Storked, the podcast in which we explore the many ways to build and define family. This is your host, Julia, and today I am so excited to introduce you to a dear friend, Monique Farouk, who runs the Infertility and Me podcast. Monique and I first met when I was a guest on her podcast, and I so fell in love with her kindness, her warmth, her humor, that I begged her to be on the Storch podcast. She is really one of a kind, and she's on a mission to create a safe community for anyone facing infertility. In fact, her stated mission is that no one is left silently suffering. Monique is special because she is a former pastor and she's been through an infertility diagnosis. So in many ways, she blends the spiritual, she blends the scientific, she blends the lived experiences so that her podcast and her stories are really a well-rounded mix of all the things that you might be going through. She's also a trailblazer. Monique is one of the first women of color who really created something in the infertility space. She created a voice, she created a community, she created a set of resources in her podcast that really didn't exist prior to her and several others. Until that time, the people who have the big TikTok or Instagram followings were young white women in heterosexual relationships talking about their infertility journeys. And while there is a very important place for those things, it's important, too, that Monique has created a broader, more encompassing space for everyone, no matter what they look like. In fact, she'll tell you on this episode that she was one of the first podcasters in the infertility space to host an LGBTQ person and their infertility journey on her podcast. So that's really remarkable. You're going to hear in this episode that as a result of her race, Monique didn't feel heard or seen or supported by her doctors at first, and that created a significant distrust for her for the medical community. We're going to talk about how infertility impacted her relationship and her sense of self, as well as her experience with infertility, with blocked fallopian tubes, with natural IVF cycles, which is an interesting thing that not a lot of doctors practice right now. And as well, having a preterm baby, a baby who was in the NICU. My goodness, that's a lot. I hope you love this episode as much as I do. If you do, please share it with a friend. You never know who might be silently suffering as a result of infertility and who could use a story like Monique's to help uplift and give a sense of community. Please don't forget to give us a nice review. Wherever you listen to podcasts, follow the Storked social media. We're on Instagram and Facebook and sign up for our newsletter. I think it's really awesome. Here is Monique. Welcome, Monique. I'm so glad to continue the conversation that we started when I was a guest on your podcast a couple months ago. And there's so much to share and so much to talk about today. So thank you so much for joining Storked, the podcast in which we explore the many ways to build and define family. Yes, it's my absolute pleasure, my dear. I can't wait for everyone to hear your episode of my show. Of course, I can't wait to spread the awareness and spread word about your show as well. So I just appreciate you. Appreciate you for having me and taking the time. And we got it together. We're here. We made it. (laughs) We did. We totally made it. And you know, talking about appreciation, you have the most interesting career and life history to get you to this point where you're doing podcasts and you're doing so many other things. And I just am so excited to talk about all that today. But by way of introduction, can you just give us a little overview of who you are mm-hmm. so that our audience gets a taste? Yeah, first of all, let me just say, I feel like we're twins today because our shirts are the we same are. freaking color. Okay, we we're are. on the same vibration. First off. <laughs> So yes, my name is Monique Farouk. I reside on the East Coast of the United States with my family. I am originally from what we call the DMV, DC, Maryland, and Virginia. And I've been here my entire life, soon to move and relocate out of this cold, 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 brisk weather. Hopefully got my fingers crossed if this market can ever fix itself. (laughs) And I have been an entrepreneur for probably about 12 years now. I went into business with my husband after we got married. And he helped me spread my entrepreneurial wings. And so here we are in this creative space that, you know, is like a breath of fresh air to be able to connect with people and talk about the things that are most important to us. Yeah. Yeah, which is, you know, fulfillment, a sense of self-identity, a sense of connectedness and community and family. 
I really love the community you've created because you talk about infertility and the various journeys and the various experiences of infertility. Can you tell us a little bit about the purpose of your podcast and really what it's all about? Yeah. So when I started the podcast November of 2019, so we're coming up on our third year anniversary in November, late November. And when I started it, it was because I didn't see a lot of diversity within the fertility space, unfortunately whether that was just fertility information podcast and or infertility podcast. And so I just, I wanted to fill that void of diversity in a way, and then also be a face for people of color to feel comfortable sharing as well as finding community. There weren't very many. I could count on one hand at the time when I started community centered around or created by black women or women of color. And you'll see a lot of that more now because people are finding their voice in creating organizations and platforms and finding their tribe. But I wanted to be what I needed. And that was a place to share and a place to do so safely. Mm, the be what I needed. I've never really thought about it that way, but I think that's also why I created Storked. It's like... Yeah. You reach out for these resources, and when they're missing, when they're absent, you say, I'll, I'll do that. I'll create that. I think so many of the people that occupy the infertility space look like me. They're a heterosexual white woman, and the voices that get drowned out are the men, are the people of color, our gay and lesbian community, which have their own pockets, but not always the trans community. I mean, we sort of keep these voices absent when we're talking about infertility and fertility journeys. Do you have a sense for why that is? Well, in terms of infertility, I'll say this, and I've been pondering on it a lot lately. Like you said, unfortunately, women of color and the LGBTQIA community, the childless after IVF and infertility community are all drowned out spaces. And so when the whole Black Lives Movement began back in 2020, I have gained a lot of followers with big, humongous pages. Who are those heterosis Caucasian women? And they just never even thought about it. Hmm. It was an afterthought to connect with people outside of whoever looks like them. And it's because in their personal life, it's the same way. And so having infertility is not going to erase people's prejudices and racism, unfortunately, and other biases against other communities like the LGBTQIA community. And unfortunately, those episodes don't get the most downloads, you know? And so that's the fact of the matter. And that is 100% the absolute truth from what I've experienced. It strikes me that infertility and fertility journeys are so isolating, right? You feel so alone in them that you kind of just batten down the hatches and go internal. And one of the things that I know yourself and I do and other members of the people who occupy the podcasting and Instagram spaces, the social media spaces, are trying to do is foster connections between and amongst one another so that we don't feel alone, so that we feel like we have a sense of connection. What is the risk then of these social media and podcasts looking like the same people, you know, and only reflecting the same voices? Is it, will it further isolate people of color who are going through infertility or will it impact their medical care if the access to information they get is about people who don't look like them? Are you concerned about either of those things? I am and I'm not because I'm okay. still here. The broken brown egg is still there. Sisters in Loss is still there. The Tanina Q. Kate Foundation is still there. Hannah's Daughters, all of these spaces that have been created by women of color and black women. And the, the problem is that it is hard for them to find you. It is so hard because the fertility, infertility spaces are the popular pages in the popular content, you have to weed through that to find people like me, you know, and to find other LGBTQIA friends and childless, not by choice friends and such like that. You have to dig and you have to dig really freaking deep. And it takes a lot of work for people to find me. 
like people have told me, I've had women of color, not just black women, come to me and be like, oh my freaking God, how did I not find your page sooner? And mm -hmm. it's not the algorithm. It's just that there's so much content being pushed out by predominantly Caucasian women. And the other flip side to that is there's just not enough people like myself advocating and creating content for those types of pages to share. And it's yeah. unfortunately, there's so many variables, again, as to why it is hard for our verse voices to be heard. But that is goes back to society and what we've always been struggling with here in America since colonialism took over. All I can do is be a voice and do my best to stay motivated for the community because it is hard. It is very, very hard when you feel like you're being drowned out. It's very difficult. I'm sorry, you guys, I'm getting emotional. <laughs> like I was telling you on my podcast, like I'm a very spiritual person. So like it's retrograde season and it's got me feeling a very, very emotional. Oh and trust me, there are days when I question my existence in that space. It is mm. very hard, you guys. It is very hard. And I'm not here to be some famous TikToker or anything like that. Or, you know, be some famous influencer that gets noticed on the street. That's not my objective. My objective is and always has been and will be to be a voice to the silent sufferers because I did it for a very, very long time. And when I tell you I was silent about my infertility struggles, I was silent. It took me four and a half years to tell a friend. Okay? Just to tell a friend. Oh, well, let's talk about that. Tell us how the journey started and... What kept you quiet for those four years? It started in 2012. My husband and I had been married for two and a half years at the time. And I was 29, getting ready to hit that big milestone of the what they call the dirty 30s, right? And so I was dying. <laughs> I forgot about those. that. <laughs> yes, that was the old saying in the early 2000s, the dirty 30s. Like we could like back then... At 20 and 21, I could never imagine what I would be doing in my 30s. But it was the year was 2012. I was had just turned 29, and we had been married for two years. We dated for two years before that, before we got married. And I had been off of birth control for a year before I had even met him. So a total of five years, and there's nothing. And my lifestyle was very different back then because I'm a former minister in the Christian faith. And so there were times of celibacy and things like that, but I had never been pregnant before in my entire life. And we, I just, I innately, again, I, I speak to my spirit self and something wasn't right. It just, it just wasn't happening. And I didn't know whether it was him or I, but I just knew deep down that something was not right and that I could possibly need help and I needed to go to the doctor and I'm a doctor girl. I will run to the doctor if I see anything that looks crazy. <laughs> I believe in medicine and I believe in science, regardless of my spiritual beliefs. And so I go and they find that my right fallopian tube was blocked mm -hmm. and the left one was fine. And they couldn't figure out why it was blocked because I didn't have any like sexual STD pass where it can leave scarring and just mesh all your insides up. And I had never had any ectopic pregnancies there was just no reason for there to be blockage there. And so I went and moved forward, my husband and I, to do an IUI cycle. And that was unsuccessful. And I didn't like the clinic that I was at. I didn't feel safe. I didn't feel like my money was good enough for me to be there. And it was in a predominantly Caucasian area of where we used to live. And the founding doctor was a heterosis. Caucasian woman and I just I didn't feel the love okay I didn't feel the love yeah. at all and I watched people and I'm observant of how they treated other patients and I didn't get treated the same I wasn't greeted with the same kind of care and love and so it turned me off it really just just turned me off and I didn't go back for four years to get help again oh, that is so astounding yeah 
But, you know, this is what we're talking about. You know, we started by talking about the podcast and your Instagram page and, and reaching more people of color. But in part, we have mm -hmm. a very broken medical system that a lot of our science mm -hmm. and research is mm -hmm. based off of men, not women. And when we do science and research, <laughs> it's based – look, I'm not a doctor, so I have to caveat what I'm going to say next. But when we do science and research, it's often based off of white women. And then you get the statistics around infant and maternal health and mortality rates, particularly in black and brown communities, and how high they are in the U.S., which yeah. just makes you sick to your stomach to think that we live in a country that allows that. So – it doesn't surprise me, and yet it surprises mm -hmm. and, and infuriates me that you felt that you were being treated differently because of your ethnicity, because of your color, by the infertility doctors you were seeing. Yeah, maybe it was a lesson for them. You know, I'm not looking for any silver linings for it. It is what it is. And unfortunately, because the medical system was developed, created, and founded upon such horrific practices of Black and Indigenous peoples and indentured servants and such, there's still that that small little, little, what's it called, residue of that. You know, when you're creating your podcast, you're thinking about mm -hmm. your intentions and stuff. And so I think a lot of the medical system was intended to be harsh against people of color. And so I feel like there's still this 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 soul tie to that that needs to be broken in the medical system and it hasn't happened yet that's the best way i can explain it at this point mm -hmm. yeah that is fascinating i think i'm going to be sitting with that one and thinking yeah. about that one for a very long time but let's go back to you when you changed doctors you said you took a break for a couple of years four i didn't go back and my husband he was like you know let's just he's a very ambitious young man and he was just like, we can do it, baby. We're going to do it ourselves, and, you know, whatever happens, happens. And we'll worry about if it doesn't happen later on. And honestly, he just wasn't ready to deal with the fact that this was our reality. Even though it wasn't him with the diagnosis, it was me. It still made him very emotional, too, in a lot of ways, and probably messed with his self-esteem a little bit. Like, you know, I can't do this thing, even though he knows that it's not him, right? And so... You know, it was just, it was a lot. It was a lot of anger. There was a lot of depression. There was a lot of sadness. There was a lot of arguments. There was just a lot of rebellion. I'm a very rebellious person, and I, and not as much as I used to be. I've kind of worked on myself in that way. But with things like this, I became very rebellious, you know, about the whole situation and how I unfortunately dealt with some things during that four-year period before we went back and sought help. But I didn't go back and seek help until I knew that we were good as a couple and that we were going to make it because I refused to bring life into this world with a person who is not who I am not committed to and that they are not committed to me either. And so when that point came in 2016, I just told him, I was like, babe, look, what, what are we going to do? <laughs> I'll be 32 at the end of the year. Matter of fact, no, I would be 33 at, in October of that year. Yeah. So was the rebellion against the mm -hmm. diagnosis, was it like you saying, there's this diagnosis and ah, I'm just going to push against it psychologically and therefore I will not go see a doctor. I'm just going to fight it. Or was it Both. against your husband? Were you guys Both. fighting? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was my, it was my, it was my shame. It was my sadness. Sorry, you guys, I can't get through this episode without crying. I'm sorry. <laughs> It's crazy. So it, it was the shame. It was the anger. It was me doing any and everything that I wanted to do in my life before and I couldn't do this. And it was it was jealousy of fertile people. It was it was I have everything else in order in my life. I did it right. I did it the way that I was taught to do it. I did it the way I thought God wanted me to do it. It was just, it was all of that. And it was spilling out into my relationship with him because he was the closest person to me. And I was taking it out on him. Then I was like exercising like a crazy woman and doing all of the things, taking all of the pills and going to see all the spiritualists and just doing everything and anything I thought would bring me closer to having a baby and being a mother and and giving my husband 
this thing that I know he wanted just as badly as I did too. It's interesting you call that rebellion. I might have termed it something like, you know, seeking and searching. But the, I can see how the two might go hand in hand. You know, you're searching for answers and you're frustrated with the responses that you're getting from the universe. Yeah. yeah. And I, and I said rebellion because there was things that I did out of out of my anger. Like, I would go out with my friend and stay out till 3 o'clock in the morning. And I'm a married woman. Like, who does that? You know what I mean? Like, so there was like, girl, I'm telling you, it was so crazy. And, um, and unfortunately, I just didn't always handle things right. And I didn't see a therapist. Like, I preach on my show now for everybody to do. And so it was just so many layers that I had to work through in order to become the person I am now and, and become the person that I was that was much better mentally and from an emotionally mature person, you know, and having yeah. to evolve a little bit more in order to become a mom because regardless of how long it takes to get that baby, if you get the bundle, you got to take care of that baby. So you want to be in the right headspace emotionally and spiritually too. That's a great way of putting it. So what turned everything around for you? You know, where how did you transition from the rebellious anger searching phase of your life to the next phase? Did you take active steps? Was it in the process of going back to the doctor? Was it in a conversation with your husband? What was the what was the genesis yeah, of that? It was point? all of those things, but then we had a candid conversation because regardless of going to the doctor and doing all of the things again in that point in my life my relationship with my husband was very important to me because we had worked so hard to be who we were as a couple and to make it work and he was like you know I don't want to argue with you I don't want to go back and forth with you and all because he was resisting going back to the doctor and so that was making me more increasingly angry and said I, and I just got to the point and I was just like I can't do it I, get, I cannot do, I said, I'm just going to leave it up to universe, God, whoever. And if he never says yes, that's what it is. We'll just be childless. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I had to come to that realization for myself because I could, there's nothing I can do to change his mind. There was nothing I could do to make him decide faster. And I just had to wait it out. And so while I was waiting it out, I was becoming the better version of me worrying about myself, the thing I could definitely control. I'm curious about this. You, you know, you say, I have a woman who believes in medicine, and you've got this complicated relationship with the fertility doctors. You don't mm -hmm. like the one that you saw. It takes you a while to go back there. But you also have a relationship with spirituality and with God. You were a preacher, and you talked about seeing spiritualists. So I'm almost sensing this, like, a little bit of a tension and what I mean by that is sometimes people say it's God's mm -hmm. will or it's it's the it's the universe. If you don't have kids, like it must be there must be a reason mm -hmm. for it. And yet here you are fighting to have your family. How do you reconcile between that like maybe this is just what God wants, maybe this is just what the universe wants, and like, but no, actually I really want to take the steps to try and create my family, which may mean seeing a doctor, it may mean talking to this person over here. How do how do you navigate the tension between those two things? Well, the, the spiritualists that I would see, and they helped ease my anxieties, and they held space for me like a therapist would. And through them, I was able to find my calm again. And for a, very, for a while, I did think that I was being punished. But then once I became more spiritually mature, I realized that it's not a punishment. It's a medical disease. Duh. Mm. You know, <laughs> I had actually been diagnosed <laughs> with right tubal blockage. Like right. it's a medical condition, girl. Right. God is not punishing you. Universe is not punishing you. Nobody's punishing you. It is a medical diagnosis and it needs to be treated according to to such. And so that is when I had the sort of epiphany that things weren't necessarily happening to us. It's just life. And they are going to be unfair, unforeseen moments, moments, years, months, where it seems like we are being punished for some kind of karmic 
law or some shit like that. You know what I mean? And I don't knock anyone who believes in that. I'm just saying for me personally, it's a medical disease. Yeah, yeah. And it's such an important distinction because you would never tell somebody who is battling diabetes or cancer, a heart attack or something, this is your punishment. Nope. Right? You say, let's get you some treatment. Only in the fertility space do we make ourselves feel like we're being punished. Because the thing is, we know that we're supposed to be able to do this thing. We have the organs, some of us, unless you have MRKH or something like that, where the organs did not develop. And so that's completely and entirely different. Or someone who's had to have their reproductive organs removed because of cancer, endo, fibroids, all of these different variables. And so I believe that is also why I was blaming it on karma or God being mad at me at one point because I was like, I got everything I need. <laughs> I think sometimes we need a third party to remind us that, no, no, this is not it. This is, this is not it. This is a disease. This is a medical condition. And I think that because society also puts pressure on couples and women to have kids and come on, go do the thing or whatever the case may be, we don't initially see our diagnosis. Or if it's someone like me who doesn't have a serious medical endo fiber or anything like that, we don't, we don't see it as something that's serious. It took me a while to realize how mm. serious this ish was. Like, girl, your body is malfunctioning, okay? And it's not your fault. Yeah. It's not your fault. Yeah. It is not your fault. No. Yeah. So it, it's hard. It, it was very hard to have that moment where I released myself of the, what's the word I'm looking for? It's like a guilt. It's like the self-flagellation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guilt, yeah. And so I encourage anyone who's going through that to to release it. Find a way to release it. Write it on a, on a piece of paper. Burn it. Whatever you choose to do. Something just do something physical that's a representation of cutting that emotion and breaking it down so you can heal emotionally and rebuild it. Yeah. That's one of my favorite exercises, if you haven't tried it, is just mm -hmm. write everything down and burn it. Yes. It's, it's so best. freeing. It's very, it is very mm -hmm. freeing. So it's hard, girl. You know how it is, Julia. Like our situations are entirely different, but you, you've made some hard decisions with even your own story. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. And it's, there's always like two components to it, in my opinion. There's the technical decision. What is the decision I'm going to make? What is the technical next step? What does my doctor say? What do... And then there's the emotional processing. And so often our emotions get in the way mm -hmm. of the technical, you know, I think life should be a certain way and it's not. So I'm angry or sad or disappointed and I can't get beyond that, so I can't reach to right. the technical. Yeah. Does that make no, sense? No, no, no. I understand yeah. because it, it's like a blockage and you become mm. blinded by that one aspect and you don't always have the full picture to be able to make a informed analytical decision and remove our emotions from it. Especially as women, we tend to be a little bit more emotional. And so we have to get past that first before we can, we can make a decision that looks right for us and and, totally. and really do the soul work to find out if this is what you really want. And so it's getting the big fat positive what you really want, or is it to live a life with this incredible human being and watch them grow and and have this extension of yourself? And that was the other thing that was pivotal for me, too. And it's like, well, am I trying to get pregnant or am I trying to be a mom? And all of what that means. And all of what that means. And how did you answer that for yourself? Yeah. And what I said, what I started thinking about and researching was what parenting would look like for me and what kind of a mother mm -hmm. I wanted to be and what kind of household did I want to run as far as being a family of three or four, if we had more or something like that. So I really just started thinking about 
Am I chasing the dream of pregnancy just so I can be pregnant and feel the magic of growing a human being in my stomach? Or is it all of it? Is it being pregnant and the idea of being this 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 mom giving my one hundred percent and instilling all of my core values and beliefs and and just watching this extension of myself grow and go into the world on her own one day. Yeah, I read something somewhere. It says that we're sometimes so focused mm-hmm, on the baby, mm-hmm, getting to mm-hmm. a baby, because babies are cute cuddly, and they're yes. like, there's something cuddly, like there's something primal about some of us, not all of us, have that, you know, that chemical urge to hold one and to cuddle one. But it's not actually about the baby. It's about raising decent human beings that will have an impact in this world. And you forget that the baby grows into a kid and then a teenager and then an adult. And so it's about the experience of raising yeah. adults. Yeah. And, and yeah. let me tell you guys, if you haven't experienced it yet, toddlerhood is a trip. So <laughs> just keep that in <laughs> mind because it's hard. Every stage of a child's life is so much different than the last and they're going to test you every day. There's another saying I'm giving you all, you guys, my sayings, my funny sayings. They'll test your gangster, okay, on a daily basis during childhood <laughs> years. It's so funny. It's fun. And it has its moments. But then there's times when you can feel overwhelmed and you feel like you are drowning. And you feel like, oh, my God, am I even doing this thing right? And so, again, you really just have to remember your why of what you're doing and what it means for your family and how it's going to change your life. And if you're scared, you better, yeah, you better be scared. You you better be scared. (laughs) I'm just about to enter toddlerhood. (laughs) You better be scared. I feel like that's exactly, I'm going in scared. The kids are just, Um, they're just, uh, they're different. They're different than when we're growing up. And if you make a mistake as a parent, they're going to call you out on it. You know, and they're not letting anything slide. Parenthood is like a reflection of what you need to work on as a human being. Honestly, that's what it feels like, parenting. Mm. Mm, It's good spiritual. (laughs) Okay, so we're talking about toddlerhood, but having gone through a long infertility journey, do you think you parent differently? Yeah, Yeah, I, I do think that I'm a little bit more conscious of what I'm doing, how I'm moving, what I'm saying, and providing space for him to share his feelings and so that he can grow up to be emotionally intelligent from the start. And hopefully he doesn't have to go to therapy about me one day. So do you ever feel, sometimes I feel like raising boys, there's like this extra Mm. burden Mm -hmm. in raising boys these days, right? Because of the toxic masculinity culture, we have to, we have a responsibility to combat that with the next generation. I feel like the weight of that is almost... I don't think I'm up for this. It's hard. It is so hard. And for me, it's hard as well because I have a masculine man with some traditional patriarchal views. And he's of South Asian descent. And so they're very traditional people by nature. And But he's a little bit more up to date in the times. But there's still some struggle there. And so having to balance what we teach him, what we share with him and how we share it with him and things that we may have prejudices about and not making that his thing, letting him decide for himself mm-hmm. and not making sure we're not arguing in front of him. And see, boys, they, they have a lot of drive, a lot of testosterone flowing through their system. And so even at a very young age, they can be a little aggressive. And so you have to approach them differently. Like I have to, whatever emotion he's feeling, I have to do the opposite. So if he's really angry, then I know I need to woo saw for a second and just come into my peaceful self. And I'm usually a peaceful person, but there's times when it can be overwhelming, you know? And so, and I just have to remind myself that, okay, he's feeling these big feelings that you two at one time weren't so good at handling either, right? Parenting is really a reflection of you. It is really a reflection of you and your weaknesses. And yeah, these boys are something else. They like to wrestle in the morning and stuff. It's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> okay. Well, so catch us up. We're talking about your lovely yeah. son and we're talking about parenting and your vision around being a parent that is different than the one that you were raised with. 
And the last we talked about your journey, tell us about the rest of your fertility journey. Yeah, so when we finally made the decision to go back and my husband was starting to get scared that we weren't going to have this family, and he said, okay, hey, let's just go ahead and do it. Let's see what happens and get our testing done. And he's fine, of course, again. But then um, I no longer had the blockage. So when the hell did that come out? I don't know. So I'm on the radiologist table and he's looking at my records and he's like, well, the blockage is not there anymore. So he looks like you're good to go. And I said, okay, well, what, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> and I'm looking for something bad and I should be happy. And I'm like, wait a minute, doc, no, this doesn't seem yeah. right. This does not seem right. <laughs> Can we do it again? <laughs> And he's like, no. It's hard to accept yes. good news, right? And he's you like, know? no, it's gone, yeah. it's gone. And he was like, sometimes I've seen where people will come back a few months later or a year later and the thing has just, the body has healed itself in some sort of way. And he said it could have been some mucus. It could have been tissue, endometrial lining tissue from my uterus that got stuck in there because the fallopian tubes are so very, very skinny. You guys are like very skinny. He explained it to me that day. And so... He said those things can happen and they'll move out along on themselves if you, you know, have an overall healthy body and stuff. And so that's probably what happened. But then I found out I had hypothyroidism as well. And I had a ton of uterine polyps all over the place that had to be cleaned up and removed before we could move forward that summer of 2016 with any further IVF treatment cycles. Because at that point, it was suggested that I just go straight to IVF and not IUI since I did have the hypothyroid issue as well as some little luteal phase issues and the polyps and stuff. Yeah. So that took about three months and I had to wait three months to even start treatment and do the egg retrieval process and all that. And so once that was completed in July of 2016, we did our first egg retrieval cycle and it was a nice mature egg, and I will say that I had natural cycle IVF, which is a less medicated form of IVF. And they don't retrieve more than one follicle at a time, and so they won't collect a bunch of eggs and stuff. They'll just take one to decrease chances of twins, and then they'll put back in one embryo if it rises with the sperm. And the first time it didn't, and so we moved on for another cycle in August of 2016, and that egg and sperm, it did its magic and it was the one, my only one. Wow, that's amazing. Now, I don't know a lot of people who have done the natural no. cycle. Did you do that for religious reasons? Were you concerned about creating embryos? Did you do it for medical reasons so that you would have less toll on your body? Option two, yeah. For I didn't want to go. I, I just felt like, well, first of all, the stipulation and the requirements were that you had to be under 35. And you couldn't have endometriosis and you couldn't have fibroids or anything like that. Like you couldn't have any real serious major conditions in order to qualify for it. And so I checked off the list. I was good. And I just wanted to start out slower. And for me, natural cycle made sense because I'm not putting my body through as much, say, than having a ton of shots and stuff. And that was the main reason for it. And I'm glad that I did it and I share it a lot on my show as well and on the Instagram page that it is an option. It is an option. And sometimes they won't always direct you to that option because it cuts the price in half too as well. It saves you a ton of money. Mm, good to know. Good to know because it's not accessible no. for everyone to be able to even consider IVF. And so if there's an option that makes it just marginally more accessible, that's yeah, important. Absolutely. So yeah. that was that was my one embryo and it worked. On the first try, essentially, like they counted it as a first try because it was the first time I had created an embryo. So it was considered the first cycle. It worked. That's great. And I had my son at 24 weeks, four days, January 2017. Yeah. Oh, he was young. Weeks. Yeah. He came early. 24 yeah. weeks. Yeah. What was that experience like? Oh, girl, like? it was rough. It was so very rough. Four months in an EQ, 129 days. And... It's so funny because I watch him now and I'm like, he's in a hurry to do everything. And I'm like, that's that's the way he came in and that's the way he's going to go out and do and live his life. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it was a very scary time. And it was a very, again, tumultuous time because 
IVF and having IVF, it makes you more susceptible to preterm labor, to having your baby early and or the baby having certain medical conditions like the heart is a huge, huge issue if you've had IVF and they make you go get an echocardiogram and stuff while you're about five months pregnant. So there's there's some risks there as well, getting IVF treatment because can cause other issues. And for me as a black woman, statistically, I'm more at risk anyway for preterm labor. And I wasn't overweight, so that diminished, but it still happened. And unfortunately, it does happen more often than we think. And it was just a really hard time having to leave my baby there every day, literally, and going to see him every day. And in the first week after I had him, I was at home finally. And then I had to go back to the hospital because I started hemorrhaging at home. And there was some tissue, some end not endometrial tissue, but there was some placental tissue in my, in my uterus still, and it had become infected. And so here I am back in the hospital. My baby's still in the hospital. I'm getting all these blood transfusions. And that first month was really rough because I was sick. He was sick. They call him being sick because he's underdeveloped, even though he's getting treated and he's okay. And he had a tube under his underarm and he still has a scar. There. He has a little battle scar is what I call it when he asked me what it is and where it came from. And it was because there was his lungs, because he was at the cusp of his lungs being fully developed and it would have been another three weeks that he needed to be in the womb for that to happen. And so there were some pockets, there was like this pocket of air that was leaking out and the oxygen should have been staying in. And so they were having to drain the lung and all this stuff. So he had this big tube. The first week, this little teeny baby that could fit in my hand with these big old tubes mm -hmm. in his chest to help him breathe better with the oscillating machine and such. And so it was a lot, girl. It was a lot. It was a lot of crying. It was it was a lot of moments that I don't know how this is gonna go. If his eyes will be fully developed, will he be able to even see me after all this? Will he be able to see me? Will he be mm. able to hear me? And these are tests that they do every week when a baby is in an EQ and he's born so very early. They test the eyes, they test the hearing, they test his motor functions. Yeah, it's it's a lot. It is a lot, 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 but we made it through. And he came home June of 2017, and he was a five months actual age, but only one month adjusted age is what it's called. And he rolled over and was holding his head up and looking at me. Wow. And he's like, I'm home, Ma. I'm good. I'm just going to roll over for you real quick. It's a strong yeah, munchkin. Just let you know that everything's okay. <laughs> We're going to be okay because you don't know until they get a little older if there's any developmental issues in the brain because they are usually born with fluid on the brain when they're born that early and it can lead to hydrocephalus and all kinds of other issues with the baby and development and being able to walk and being able to talk and understand. So it was a lot of unknowns, much like infertility. He's never had any developmental. So we were very blessed by that. And so I don't take it for granted, none of it, none of it at all, because it could be much different. My life could be much different having a special needs child. Well, we started this, and we'll go in full circle, by talking about the community that you've built with your podcast, with your Instagram page and social media. And it strikes me that you have this challenging balance because for you, the family you envisioned worked out. But for so many people who visit your page, who listen to your podcast, and for probably who reach out to you, even your guests, don't necessarily have that end to mm -hmm. their story. There there are so many different ways these stories yeah. end, and yours is only one of them. How do you navigate supporting all the members of your community, even when your story looks like the ideal? Yeah. I know exactly what you mean, and a lot of people have asked me, you know, why do I do so much when I've gone to the other side in the very beginning? And now I don't get that question as often, but in the beginning I did get that question a lot. And it gave me it gave me purpose. It helped me heal from my own story, being able to connect with other people and go on other platforms such as this one and share and move through some more healing. And 
man, I don't tire of it. A lot of people would think that you would tire mm. of talking about it. And there's moments where I have been tired of talking about it. And then I remember why I started it. And it wasn't for me. It's not for me. It is for the community. It is for the voiceless. It is for the silent sufferers. Hmm. But, but those silent sufferers, those people who follow and engage with your content, what are some of the questions you get from them? What are some of the themes that they're grappling with and are curious about through yeah, your content? Grief is a huge one. Grief of infertility, grief of miscarriages and losses, because IVF does increase your chances of miscarriages, early miscarriages and late miscarriages. Grief is a really, really big issue right now, and a lot of people are struggling with it, which is why I recently had on a psychotherapist to talk about practical ways that we can move through that grief. And so, and then also I do tend to get a lot of LGBTQIA community members reaching out to me because I have been so vocal about my stance on everyone being able to have a platform to share on. And I think I was one of the first mm -hmm. casters from a, a heterosexual standpoint that featured LGBTQIA community members. A lesbian woman was my first community member who came on the show in 2019. Well, you've touched so many people and you've talked to so many people and you've gone through so many different versions of your own story, versions of yourself through your story. Now where you sit, how do you define family? Family? What does it mean Family to you? is love. Family is love, and it doesn't matter how you attain that family, whether it's adoption, IUI, at-home inseminations, whether it's taking on the role of a parent for a family member who can't do it themselves. Family is love, and it is not defined by our small, puny little minds as compared to this big, big universe we live in, and love is ever expanding and yeah for me family is just love 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 in a safe space mm -hmm. and so that's all these kids really need is love in a safe space mm, I agree with that and I like that concept love is always expanding if we would like to follow you if we want to see your content hear your podcasts connect with you personally how do we infertility and me podcast on the gram it is where i am most prevalent i do not use facebook anymore i am not even on facebook anymore i can't stand it and i hate that i have to use social media mm -hmm. to build the community too but that's the way i can spread the message far and wider than traditional you know ways of of creating community but yeah infertility and me podcast on the gram and if you search infertility and me podcast or just infertility and me I'll, so, I'll show up in your favorite audio platform as well as youtube yeah yeah <laughs> awesome it's really gang it's really worth a listen it's really special monique it is so wonderful to chat with you today thank you so much for taking yes, the time it's my absolute pleasure thank you for letting me talk to your listener friends and family I appreciate you so very much, Julia. It's been a blast, girl. Too. Thank you for listening to Storked with your host, Julia Carroll. This podcast is changing the conversation around the ways people define and create family. If you like what you hear, please support us by sharing with friends and following on Instagram at Storked underscore podcast. We also always appreciate it when you rate and review us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. For more information, visit storkedpodcast.com to sign up for our newsletter. That's S-T-O-R-K-D podcast.com.